and a public advocate. Members, please take your seats. Members, please take your seats. Quiet in the chambers, please. Please close the doors. Members, please take your seats, even those in the corner. <laughs> members, members, thank you. Thank you so much. Members in the back, may you take your seats, please. Thank you. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Adams. Present. Ampri Samuel. Present. Ayala. Present. Barron. Present. Borelli. Brannon. Here. Cabrera. Here. Chin. Here. Cohen. Constantinides. Cornegie. Present. Deutsch. Present. Diaz, Drum, Espinal, Constantinides, Eugene, Present, Gibson, Present, Jonai, Gradenchik, Holden, Kalos, Here, King, Ku. Kozlowitz, Lansman, Lander, Levin, Levine, here, Mizell, Menchaca, Presente, Miller, Moya, present, Perkins, Powers, present, Reynoso. Richards. Present. Rivera. Rodriguez. Go here. Rose. Rosenthal. Here. Salamanca. Present. Torres. Shh. Present. Traeger. Here. Ulrich. Here. Ballone. Here. Perkins. Van Bramer. Here. Williams. Here. Jaeger. Matteo. Matteo. Combo. Present. Speaker Johnson. You. All quiet in the chambers, please. All rise for the invocation. The invocation will be delivered by Father Jonathan Morris of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church at 627 East 187th Street in the Great Borough of the Bronx. Quiet in the chambers. I begin as I do in my own faith tradition in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, merciful God, Father God, as leaders in our community, we have been given so much. And we acknowledge when we are humble that much will be asked of us, much more than our constituents or our parishioners ask of us, that you will ask of us. Today, I ask you to awaken us 
from our slumber. Awaken us, O Lord, from the slumber of selfishness that can grip each and every one of us. As community leaders, we can easily be mesmerized by power, mm -hmm. fame, mm -hmm. money, and the deadly desire of being liked and praised by all. Yes, much will be asked of us by you. What is it that you ask of us? Lord, at least I say this to you now, I believe that you are asking of me and of my brothers and sisters here that we be servant leaders. Mm -hmm. To be servants, not of ourselves, of our agendas, but rather to be servants of the women and men that we represent. Servant leadership is not an easy standard, we know, God, because left to our own powers or desires, it is so tempting to serve our own interests. But today I ask you, Almighty God, as a friend of these community leaders, to descend upon these civic leaders in front of me and to give them a new desire, make it a miracle, a new desire and commitment to be servant leaders. Give them a burning desire to sacrifice their own interests, to serve the interests of every one of their constituents, even when it's not helpful or convenient to them and to do so by measuring up their daily objectives, what they do each day, with the common good of society, what is good, beautiful, and true for those that they represent and lead, based on the dignity of every human person. Finally, I pray that these women, that these men in this great chamber will never, ever forget to give preferential treatment to the poor, the weak, the disadvantaged, the defenseless in our city. Amen? Amen. 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 Please be seated. Quiet in the chambers, please. A motion to spread the invocation. Council Member Torres. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Father Jonathan Morris is a religious leader of national stature, but I know him as the pastor of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church, a century-long fixture in the very heart of Belmont. As the head of Mount Carmel, Father Morris has been on the front lines of comforting families who lost their loved ones and their homes amid the devastation of the Belmont fire. One cannot begin to imagine the anguish of a father or a grandfather struggling to cope with the loss of a child who lived only for seven months. It is family like those who have felt the consoling impact of Father Morris. Not only has he been a central presence in countless wakes and funerals and candlelight vigils, he has also taken it upon himself to raise more than $200,000 to support the displaced families of the Belmont Fire. And so I ask my colleagues to join me in expressing the deepest gratitude to Father Morris for serving the Belmont community, for serving the city of New York in a moment of greatest need. Along that journey, and it hasn't been easy. So, Richie, congratulations to you. This is community leaders of all types working together. We need you, and we need servant leadership that you've provided. Thank you. And I don't, I don't know if he's still here, but we, we, we were also joined earlier today by the father of Emmanuel Mensa, uh, who rushed into a burning building so that he could save his neighbors. Uh, he was only in this country for a few years. He was a soldier, but at a time when immigrants are vilified 
Emmanuel Mensah represents the very best that our city and our country has to offer. And so I don't know if he's here, but if you can join me in expressing our deepest gratitude to his father as well. So. Madam Public Advocate, thank you for allowing me to speak, and I now wish to make a motion that the invocation be spread in full upon the record. Thank you, so moved. Adoption of the minutes, Council Member Miller. Uh, Madam Public Advocate, I, I move to adopt the me minutes of the stated meeting of February 14th, 2018, and for them to be adopted as printed by Council Member Miller. So moved. Messages and papers from the mayor. M27, Office of Nightlife. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. Preconsidered M28 and M29, Council Operating Budget. Finance. M30 and M31, Office of Management and Budget. Finance. Petitions and communications. None. Land use call-ups. None. Quiet in the chambers as we now hear from the speaker, Speaker Corey Johnson. Uh, good afternoon. I am happy to see everyone braved the storm uh, yesterday, last night, and through the night of another nor'easter. We have lost a few brave New Yorkers in the past week, and I would like to recognize each one of them. Just the other day, an MTA worker named St. Clair Richard Stevens died after he suffered a head injury from a fall as he was cleaning tracks near the East 125th Street subway station. We are saddened by this deeply tragic loss of life and our thoughts are with this young man's family and friends. New York lost two first responders who courageously answered the call on September 11th, 2001. We honor firefighter Thomas Phelan, who on September 11th evacuated hundreds of people from the attacks. Thomas was working as a ferry captain when tragedy struck ground zero. He died last week from a 9-11 related illness and our thoughts are with Thomas's family, friends, and our FDNY family. We also lost Keith Young, a retired firefighter who also succumbed to a 9-11 related illness this past weekend. Keith bravely saved many on that fateful day and was known as the beloved firehouse chef who showcased his culinary skills on two famous shows, Chopped and Throw Down with Bobby Flay. Our thoughts are with Keith's children who tragically lost their mother to breast cancer six years ago. May Keith rest in peace. The FDNY also lost two of its own in last week's devastating helicopter crash in Iraq. Fire Marshal Christopher Tripp Zanidis and Lieutenant Christopher Raguso, who also served as Captain Master Sergeant of the New York National Guard, respectively. We also mourn Staff Sergeant Deshaun Briggs, Captain Andreas O'Keefe, Captain Mark K. Weber, Master Sergeant William R. Porsche, and Staff Sergeant Carl P. Ennis. I would like to also honor the life and legacy of a legendary newsman, Les Payne, who died earlier this week. Les broke ground as one of the first to report on racial inequality in New York City. He was fearless, he was passionate, and his loss leaves a void in journalism. We in the council will never forget Les and his reporting, and our thoughts are with his family during this difficult time. And also, we lost someone in another country. We lost a council member named Mario Franco in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, who was assassinated because she spoke out against police brutality in the city of Rio. Her loss has been covered around the world for her fearlessness and for this political assassination because she was stepping up and speaking truth to power. If we could all please rise. All take, rise. Take a moment of silence for all the folks that we have lost.
Thank you all. So we are going to jump into our docket for the day. Uh, the council will vote on a number of finance items. Uh, first, the council will be voting on uh, five uh, Article 7 uh, property tax exemptions. The first exemption uh, is for a property located at 346 East 21st Street in Councilmember Carlina Rivera's district. It is going to preserve 30 units of affordable rental housing. The second exemption is for Red Hook Gardens property in Councilmember Carlos Menchaca's district, which is going to preserve 62 units of affordable rental housing. The third, fourth, and fifth exemptions are for three different Manhattanville projects uh, and properties located in Councilmember Mark Levine's district. Uh, each are going to construct uh, 20 units, 7 units, and 15 units for low income households. Second, the council will be voting on uh, its operating budget as prepared by the City Council's Administrative Services Division. This budget will help the New York City Council fulfill its mission to the people of New York City. The increases largely stem from adding staff to help the council fulfill its mission in the Land Use Division, the Legislative Division, the Finance Division, New Oversight and Investigations Division. For example, two of the core functions of the council are, of course, to legislate bills through our legislative process and to negotiate the city's budget. And to that end, adding staff and resources to those two divisions is critical to fulfilling these functions moving forward. I said I was going to do this throughout the speaker's race, and I am fulfilling my promise. And as I said, I am also um, adding staff money for a potential charter revision commission and creating an oversight and investigations division and unit. These are things that I promised and that I'm committed to. I am proud that the council is taking this step today. It is important for us to do this for our charter mandated responsibility. It is important for us to do this to pay our staffs well. It is important for us to do this to continue to do good work that we've done in, of course, the last four and eight years, but especially the last three months. So I am glad uh, that we are doing this. I want to thank the staff that worked on this. Uh, Marcello Testa, Latanya McKinney, and Rebecca Chasen all played a vital role in crafting this. We didn't do this overnight. We spent the last three months speaking to every single division, understanding what their exact needs were, and that is how we crafted this. The council will also be voting on a number of land use items. The council will vote to rezone 3510 Astoria Boulevard, located in Councilmember Costa Constantinides' district, and Sea Park North, which is located in Councilmember Mark Traeger's district. In addition, the council will vote on proposed sites for the construction of two primary school in Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer's district and to redevelop the former Spotford Juvenile Detention Center into 700 units of affordable housing and light manufacturing space in Council Member Rafael Salamanca's district, who is our land use chair. It is a big deal to turn a former detention center into affordable housing and to a place for economic vibrancy and activity and opportunity. I want to congratulate Councilmember and Chair Salamanca on this very big win, uh, on this hard fought victory. And I want to uh, invite Councilmember Salamanca to spend a minute talking about his project and then Councilmember Van Bramer to talk about the construction of two new schools. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am extremely excited to be here today to announce what we've been able to do with this juvenile detention center that's been in my district for over 50 years. It was an eyesore and an embarrassment to the South Bronx. In 2011, this juvenile detention center was closed, and since 2013, I have been working on this project uh, as a district manager for Bronx Community Board 2. Now as a local council member, alongside with Community Board 2 and local community-based organizations, HPD, we're transforming this dark piece of land to over 740 units of 100% affordable housing MIH option one. 40% of these units will remain permanently affordable instead of 20%. A commitment from a, from a 40 year to a 60 year regulatory period for the balance of the residential units that are not permanently affordable per MIH. There will be 10% homeless set aside for independent living and I've ensured very deep affordability with rents going as low as $396 a month. Uh, this uh, project or this um, development will have a food setup incubator space, light manufacturing, youth and wellness space. Labor will do the demolition phase and other skill-based 
um, phase outs, the project will create over 200 permanent houses uh, for this. I want to thank, I'm sorry, over 200 permanent jobs will be created out of this project. Shh. I would like to thank the land use staff, Raju, Amy, Jeff, and Julie. I want to thank Bronx Community Board 2, the chair, Bobby Crespo, the district manager, Ralph Acevedo, and their land use chair, Nick Mario. Uh, I want to thank Urban Health Plan, The Point, EDC, uh, Charlie Samboy. And, you know, I've been in office just a little over two years. I've been involved, uh, I have approved, this is my ninth Euler in, uh, in two years, and I've approved over 4,000 units of 100% affordable housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Congratulations, Councilman Salamanca. Hey, folks, could please Quiet, hold the applause? Please. Thank you. Councilman Van Bramer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. So today is a really big day for Long Island City, Queens, a big day for the parents, and families, and children of District 30, particularly in Long Island City. We are, uh, I hope, about to approve two brand new elementary schools, nearly 1,200 additional seats uh, being voted on and cited today as a result of these votes, well over $100 million in investments in new school buildings. As many know, District 30 is among the most crowded school districts in the city of New York. I also have a portion of District 24, two of the most crowded school districts in New York City. Long Island City is one of the fastest growing neighborhoods in New York City, if not the entire United States of America. But you can't have good neighborhoods without good schools and parents knowing that they'll have a good school to send their children to. So today's vote is really historic for our district, uh, but it also marks the 13th and 14th new school buildings, open, funded, or cited in my district in the last eight years. So we are. We're going to remove folks if you if you yell out. We, this is a this is a place that everyone gets the opportunity to speak here. If folks yell out, we're going to remove you. We had hearings; people had the opportunity to speak. If you could please finish, Councilmember Van Bramer. Thank you very much, Speaker Johnson. So once again, we are thrilled for the children and families of my community. Thrilled with the 13th and 14th new schools badly needed, long fought for, well deserved for the parents, families, and children of District 30 in Queens, and in particular for Long Island City. And we are not done. I want to send a message to the parents and the families and the children in Court Square and other parts of Long Island City that are seeing uh, large-scale development. We are going to continue to fight and press for more new schools. We are not done with these two. But thank you in advance to my colleagues for their support of these two very important new schools in my district. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, Councilman Van Bramer. It's a very big deal, of course, to get one school, so to get two schools, and I know you've gotten over a dozen schools in your district since you started here in the council. It is uh, tremendous and gonna help so many people, so congratulations. We are also gonna vote today to rezone Jerome Avenue in the Bronx, located in council members Fernando Cabrera and Vanessa Gibson's districts. I know this has been a tremendous amount of hard work for both council members Gibson and Cabrera. I wanna congratulate them on their efforts in delivering two new public schools, critically needed capital investments in parks, the preservation of affordable housing, the construction of new affordable housing, the saving of jobs and many other things. So I invite council members Cabrera and Gibson to uh, take a minute each and to speak on this. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud here to be here today at this great moment for the West Bronx, the Risonia Jerome Avenue is a major victory for the people of the West Bronx. And I want to congratulate and thank my colleague, Council Member Vanessa Gibson, for her hard work and partnership with me in this effort. After years of community planning and dialogues with thousands of resident business owners, nonprofit organizations, uni unions, community board four, five, and seven, and elected officials, we have created a shared vision of the future of our neighborhoods in which all residents are served. Jerome Avenue is a major, major part of the commercial life of my district. I work to expand the original footprint of the rezoning area to its current 95 block area. Our communities will benefit greatly from major investment in preserving 2,500 units of affordable housing, the creation of new affordable housing. School, community school district 10, one of the most overcrowded school districts in the district will get a brand new 458 seat 
primary school, which will include a youth community center to house an after-school program and a new uh, gymatorium at PS 247. My district, Davidson Community Center, has served the community for decades, providing much needed social and community services, frequently hosting community events. To invest in this important facility and make it accessible, we are investing $1.9 million to install and elevate and expand the building to a full second floor. And more than 30 million will be invested in District 14 parts. The investment throughout this process, I affirm my commitment to this community, recognizing the tremendous needs and challenges that we face. The Jerome Avenue rezoning is a prototype for a future rezoning project, setting high standards for collaboration and community input. Proud of the work that we have done to build a bright future for the West Bronx. I want to give a special thanks to Speaker Corey Johnson, Chair Rafael Salamanca, Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr., and to the Land Use Good Division, Ryu right, Mann, uh, Amy Levitan, and Jeff Yuen uh, for all the hard work, and my Chief of Staff, Greg Faulkner, Deputy Chief of Staff, Anthony Springer, and Claire McAveen, Legislator and Director, uh, Legislative Director. Thank you so much, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Speaker. Congratulations, Councilmember Gibson. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon to all of my colleagues and everyone who is here. I am so honored to stand before you as a member of the New York City Council, representing District 16, and all of the work that the Jerome Neighborhood Rezoning Plan will achieve. I have always stood firm on my values and my principles and certainly my faith, and I am so glad that after three years of hard work, countless hours of meetings, dialogue, fellowship, all of the open houses, visioning sessions, round tables, community meetings, demonstrations, press conferences, here we are today. $189 million of capital investments and infrastructure work for a borough like the Bronx, and in particular, the West Bronx. Many of us recognize for far too long the Bronx has been the forgotten borough. We have faced enormous challenges. We have lived through the dark era of the price out and the burn out. And now that we have brighter days ahead and we're seeing neighborhoods change tremendously across the city of New York, now this is an opportunity for the Bronx to get what it has rightfully deserved for decades and decades when no one gave a second glance at the Bronx. I am proud of what we have achieved in the West Bronx because this is the largest and most comprehensive zoning that is facing the West Bronx for decades, since the 1960s. We have not had a major investment like this. And so I stand before you proud and honored at all of the work that has been achieved. This has not been an easy journey. This has been one of the most difficult and challenging decisions I have ever made as an elected official. But you know what? At the end of the day, I'm going to leave office making sure that my district is better than the way I got it when I was elected in November of 2013. I am proud of what we have achieved. Two brand new elementary schools for school districts 9 and 10, when we know our families are starving for school seats in the West Bronx. Working alongside our colleague, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, and on all of the decades of broken promises that the Bronx has faced, this neighborhood plan will bring real and lasting contributions to the West Bronx and all of its people. I am proud to say that this final plan includes significant investments in creating and preserving affordable and deeply affordable housing while expanding on the substantial preservation work. Councilor Gibson, Councilor Gibson, if you could hold up. Sergeants, if you could, if you, if you could uh, remove the folks in the balcony, uh, that would be helpful. So Councilor Gibson could respectfully finish her remarks on this big victory. Thank you. I'm proud to say that this final plan includes significant investment in creating and preserving affordable and deeply affordable units 
while expanding on the substantial preservation work that has already been achieved. 2014 to 2017, 5,500 units of affordable housing has been preserved. So the, the whole balcony is going to be cleared. The whole balcony is going to be cleared.
Let me continue. Mr. Speaker. Hold on one moment. So before I turn it back over to um, back over to Councilmember Gibson, the public advocate needs to step out uh, for a few minutes. So during her absence, I appoint Majority Leader Cumbo as a presiding officer over this stated meeting, and I want to turn it back over to Councilmember Gibson, who I congratulate again on this great victory for her district. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Madam Majority Leader. And I think you know many of you can understand the challenge that we've had over the past three years. Um, certainly many of you recognize why I pray so much, um, because this has not been easy. Uh, the West Bronx cannot be allowed to be stuck in the past. We deserved investment yesterday, we deserve it today, and we deserve it tomorrow. And our community deserves to be a part of the future of the city of New York. And while many of the conversations during the planning process focused on housing creation and zoning changes, this plan goes far beyond that. In addition to the 5,500 units that have already been preserved, we are committed to an additional 2,500 units of affordable housing that are to be preserved over the next two years. I talked about the two public schools, which will be a great benefit for all of the families in school districts 9 and 10 and also the commitment that all housing that's built on publicly owned land will be permanently affordable to low income and very low income families. Set asides for formerly homeless families as well as seniors. We are reaching those families that are at the lowest end of the spectrum. An agreement to map the MIH option one as well as the deep affordability option in this area. When developers build, they will have to set aside 20% of their units for permanently affordable units of housing for families at the extremely low and low income brackets. We are appointing a Jerome specific workforce development coordinator whose responsibility will be to work with all of the auto businesses and small businesses in the corridor for local hiring and employment opportunities for our people. We have secured $1.5 million to help our auto businesses that we recognize may potentially be displaced as a result of this zoning. We've also given community groups funds to provide training for our auto businesses to prepare for the jobs of today and tomorrow. We don't want our auto workers to be employees for the rest of their lives, but we want them to eventually become owners and take ownership of their property. We are creating a working group on Jerome Local Hiring and Responsible Contracting that will be led by Councilmember Cabrera and myself. We are going to secure real and meaningful local hiring provisions for construction projects along the corridor and elevate the responsible contracting conversation across the city. We have secured $60 million for parks and community boards four and five, and I'm very proud that we're getting $25 million for Grant Park and $4.6 million for Corporal Fisher. We are creating a Southwest Bronx Housing Task Force that will be led by the Bronx Bar President, Council Member Cabrera, and myself to address the long-term quality of life issues that tenants are facing today in our community. We are creating a Jerome Avenue Public Health Task Force to be addressing health disparities along the Jerome Corridor. I am so proud of the work that has been done to get us to this point. There are a lot more amenities in this plan, but certainly if anyone wants to talk to me offline, I'm more than happy to share that with you. But I want to commend the incredible team that worked with us and walked with us every step of the way. The Land Use Division, Raju Mann, Jeff Ewan, our project manager, and Amy Levitam have been absolutely exceptional. Our land use chair, Rafael Salamanca, and our subcommittee on zoning chair, Francisco Moyer, have been amazing in guiding me along this process. 
all of the colleagues I've had the honor of talking to that proposed previous rezonings that have been helpful to me, I want to thank you. From DCP, I want to recognize Carol, Michael, and Sean from City Planning, my Chief of Staff, Dana Wax, my Deputy Chief of Staff, Wendy Gallegos, and many of the advocates, stakeholders, community groups, and everyone who I listen to and will still listen to after today. There is a lot of work that remains to be done to ensure that we hold the administration accountable for all of the agreements that they made in this document that has 69 different points of commitments that many I didn't describe today. But I truly want to thank all of you for your support, for your prayers, for your guidance, for your input, and I ask you to join Councilmember Cabrera and I in supporting this so we can leave a lasting legacy of what this body has done to improve a borough like the Bronx. The time is now. There's so much at stake. We have a lot of opportunity, and I want to make sure that my borough is left in better hands as a result of the Jerome Neighborhood Rezoning Plan. I ask you for your support, and I thank you in advance for your support. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, congratulations, Councilmember Gibson. I also want to thank Jeff Ewan, who spent an enormous amount of time on this from the Land Use Division as the Project Manager, Amy Levitan, our Deputy Director of Land Use, Julie Lubin, our General Counsel, Brian Paul, John Douglas, James Lloyd, and of course, Raju Mann. Next, the Council will vote on Introduction 605A, sponsored by Councilmember Steve Levin, which will require the NYPD to report on a quarterly basis the number of arrests and summonses issued for low-level marijuana possession, disaggregated by the offense charged, race of the offender, gender of the offender, age of the offender, borough in which the offense took place, and the precinct, housing police service area, or transit bureau where the offense was enforced. From the staff, I want to thank Beth Gollum, Deepa Ambakar, Casey Addison, and Steve Reister for their help on this. Uh, we are also going to vote on introduction uh, 262, sponsored by Councilmember Donovan Richards, which would amend Local Law 27 of 2015, requiring the Department of Education to report on various data regarding the provision of special education services, requiring them to report the number of students in each school who have an individualized education program or an IEP. From the staff, I want to thank Elizabeth Hoffman, uh, Smita Deshmukh, uh, Andrea Vasquez, and Tirza Nasser. Finally, we will vote today to extend rent regulation laws in New York City. Rent regulation is the most critical tool we have for maintaining affordable housing in our city. My legislation, Introduction 600A and Resolution 188A, would extend the finding that a housing emergency exists in New York City, requiring the extension of rent regulation laws for the next three years. I am proud that three years ago, before I was Speaker, I carried these bills, extending rent protections for the 2.5 million New Yorkers who live in rent-regulated or rent-controlled apartments. We, of course, know we have an affordability crisis that is gripping our city. We talk a lot about affordable housing on this side of City Hall and on the other side of City Hall. The easiest way to protect affordable housing is to preserve the affordable housing that we have and to strengthen the rent laws. We need to strengthen our rent laws. They're up for renewal and expiration in June of 2019, and I am fully committed to standing with many of the advocates and activists that were here today for a press conference in a campaign over the next 15 months to strengthen the rent laws, uh, getting rid of and repealing vacancy decontrol, uh, getting rid of the issues around preferential rent and on major capital improvements, and ensuring that we protect even more New Yorkers and not lose the critical rent-regulated housing that we have. We've lost hundreds of thousands of units since the early 1990s, and I am committed to ensuring that we don't just pass this renewal today, which extends it on the city level for three years, but Locked next off. year we actually strengthen our rent laws. So I ask you all to vote in favor of this legislation, Introduction 600A and Resolution 188A. I want to thank from the staff Megan Chen, Caitlin Fahey, and Jose Conde. That completes the highlights of our docket, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. Thank you all very much.
Discussion of general orders? Seeing none, we'll have the report of special committees. None. Report of standing committees. Report of the Committee on Education, intro 262, Special Education Services. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Finance, preconsidered Reso 239, Organization Funding. Coupled on general orders. Preconsidered LUs 45 and Reso 245 and LU 49 and Reso 249, re tax exemptions. Coupled on general orders. Preconsidered M28 and Reso 250 and M29 and Reso 251, Council Operating Budget. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, intro 600. A, extending the rent stabilization laws. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LU21 and Reso 252, and LU22 and Reso 253, landmark designations. A motion to disapprove. LU31 and Reso 254, through LU34 and Reso 257, the peninsula. Coupled on general orders. LU35 and Reso 258, disposition of four city-owned properties. Coupled on general orders. LU39 and Reso 259 and LU40 and Reso 260, school facilities. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Public Safety, intro 605A, reports on marijuana possession. Amended and coupled on general orders. On the general order calendar, intro 720, site safety training. Laid over. LU15 and Reso 261 and LU16 and Reso 262, Sea Park North. Coupled on general orders. Orders. LU 17 and Reso 263 through LU 19 and Reso 265, Jerome Avenue. Coupled on general orders. LU 28 and Reso 266 and LU 29 and Reso 267, Astoria Boulevard. Coupled on general orders. Resolution appointing various persons, Commissioner of Deeds. Coupled on general orders. We're not going to couple anything else. I'd like to ask for a roll call vote on all items on today's general order calendar. Ulrich. Aye on all. Adams. Aye on all. Ampri Samuel. Aye on all. Ayala. Aye on all. Barron. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm voting aye on all with the exception of LU 28 and 29, which I had voted uh, nay in the committee. And also, I just want to express uh, my hesitation in voting on the Jerome rezoning. As you may recall, I voted against the East New York rezoning plan and several other plans since then because I think that as a body, we have a flawed premise where we don't, in fact, have a greater uh, percentage of housing that we are dedicating to people who are homeless and people who are low income. In the prayer this morning, uh, the person who brought the prayer talked about having advantage for those who are underrepresented, who are marginalized. And I think that that's a part of our obligation to do that. And I don't think that we as a body have the uh, wherewithal or the format to allow for us to do that so that we can represent that body of people um, appropriately and give them what they need to be properly represented and to level the playing field that they are facing. So it's with hesitancy that I vote uh, for the Jerome rezoning because there's still the opportunity, as has been explained to me, for market rate to come to that area even before the regulatory agreements expand or, 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 or terminated or reach their expiration date. And I'm concerned about that because certainly we know the Bronx is an area that's economically challenged. So I just want us to look to see, maybe we need to go back and redesign this MIH program that we have, because it's not bringing housing in adequate numbers to the people who need it most. Thank you. Brennan. Vote aye on all. Cabrera. Aye on all, and thank you uh, to all my colleagues for, for your support. Chin. Uh, permission to explain my role? Yes. Thank you. Um, I rise today because we are voting um, on opportunity to create and preserve more affordable housing. And I wanted to congratulate my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Gibson, Cabrera, Salamanca. You guys are leading the examples in the Bronx, and I hope that we can also create these kind of opportunity in Manhattan, where 
we also need you know, greater affordability. And I thank the speaker for taking the lead on extending red regulation, because that's the only way that we can protect and preserve the affordable housing that we have. And with a sad note, because I wanted to remember a young father and a young activist, a young architect in, our, in my district, Ricky Leung, who was a fighter for affordable housing. And I remember knocking on doors with him uh, when he was the tenant leader and going to Washington fighting to protect project-based Section 8 building. And I remember celebrating with him that we were able to get a 40-year extension for the building that his family and all the residents, over 600 units, were preserved. Um, and we lost him. We lost him to cancer. Um, but he is someone that we will remember and cherish because he was a great example of a young person that was able to work with every um, racial group, not just his own. He was able to reach out to everyone. And he was a young person, um, started at a young age. And I, my heart and prayer goes out to his parents because um, he was their only child. And um, may he rest in peace and know that we will continue the fight to protect and preserve affordable housing in our city. Thank you. I vote aye on all. Konstantinidis. With congratulations to all my colleagues on the rezonings and bills today, I vote aye on all. Carnegie. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. I probably vote aye on uh, all today, especially um, the rezonings, uh, and just would like to say that as the chair of the newly minted MWVE task force, I look forward to finding as many ways as possible, especially on the rezonings, to include not only MWVE participation, but LVE participation. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Deutsch. Aye on all. Aye on all. Diaz. Permission to explain a vote? Yes. Madam Chair, Lady and Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, today is a great day. It's a little sad to see a bunch of agitators stopping such a wonderful, workaholic, dynamic lady working for her, trying to do something for her community. So it's a shame to see how special agitators do that. Vanessa Gibson, you are together with Council Member Cabrera. You have made the Brom, all of us in the Brom feel proud of you. Continue doing it. And Salamanca, the three of you, you know, the Bible said that without vision, the people perish. And the three of you have a vision, a vision for the poor, 740 unit housing unit. 100% affordable, that's on call, that's, that's, that is something never done. And Mr. Speaker, you are part of that. I'm proud of you too because you have allowed, you have given all your support to these three council members so the Bronx could look good, the, bottom, the, bottom, the, the Bronx Board of President, thank you, I thank you and we all thank you. And in that sense, Mr. Speaker, uh, and another, I would like to bring to your attention, knowing, and I know that you know, four taxi drivers have killed themselves. Another one hanged himself the other day. So we, I'm asking, I'm asking you as the chairman of the committee on for hire to help me pass a bill that I'm trying to do, to do away with you and to help this. We cannot allow more taxi drivers to keep hanging themselves, killing themselves, because the, it is a shame what's going on. And we, this council, under your leadership, that you have proven to be one of the best council speakers that this city has gotten in many years. We're so proud working with you. And the Bronx, thank you. And Vanessa, again, thank I you. apologize for those uh, agitators, Council Member Cabrera and Salamanca. Thank you, Councilmember Diaz. Right on. I vote yes on all.
Thank you. Uh, Council Member, to remind you of that praise and thank you in the difficult days ahead. Uh, who's next? Rodriguez. Can you explain my vote? Yes. Gentrification is real in our city, and we had to understand the feeling of many great organizers. So yes, Harlem is no majority black anymore. Working class being pushed out from Brooklyn, from Long Island City. Still, we need to look on how to be creative and be able to learn from previous rezoning to do any current and future rezoning much better. I'm happy to see all the gain that my colleagues, they were able to bring to the Bronx because Inwood is next. We are up to August 16 to vote on the Inwood rezoning. And I just looking to double whatever they got on Giron. So thank you, you know, my colleague for negotiating, but you know, everyone should know, especially every day our city been pushing our working class out. You know, and still today we have more than 40% of New Yorkers living under the poverty lines. And for decades we've been investing billions and billions of dollars only in the Midtown area, in the underserved communities from Jerome, Washington Heights, and other area, they have been left out. So I congratulate my colleague Cabrera and Gibson for to do the best they can, but at the same time, we also have to understand the real fear that many New Yorkers has through the Bronx, Washington Heights, and Harlem, because every day we are pushing a working class. So thank you for your leadership. I'm looking to learn. And EDC and City Hall, be ready, because I would like to double whatever you provide to your own. Thank you. With that, I vote aye. And Councilman Rodriguez, we're so happy to have your beautiful daughters here with you today. Drum. Vote aye and all. Espinal. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, be, give a big congratulations to Vanessa and Cabrera. I know it's not an easy task to carry these rezonings. I uh, carried the first one, and it was East New York. And I have to say that uh, the reason I moved forward is because I felt confident that I had the investments and the commitments needed to make sure that East New York continues being a thriving community. And I have no doubt that these members have done their same in their neighborhoods. There's a lot of anxiety, and we get that. But let me tell you about what's happening in East New York. In East New York, we have seen unprecedented unpre levels of applications for affordable housing to be built with zero market rate housing being applied for in that rezone area. So I know that these rezonings will create affordable housing as they intended to do, and will give the people in that neighborhood the investments they need to continue to be able to call themselves Bronx, and Knight, Bronx Knights or New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. And how do you vote? I voted aye. Thank you. Eugene. I would aye. Gibson. Please explain very quick. Yes. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader, and thank you once again to all of my colleagues. I really and truly appreciate the support. And one thing I know uh, firmly about the Jerome Neighborhood Plan is that it is going to stimulate the stimulate the exact type of housing that we need in the borough of the Bronx. And I understand the fear, the anxiety, but understand that this administration, through the city council, successfully passed right to council, codifying to make sure that residents facing eviction get legal assistance in housing court to prevent evictions. We've also successfully passed certificate of no harassment, which will start in the Jerome area. So I am very proud of that because the neighborhood rezoning plan cannot be achieved without successful policies that are also complementing the work that we are doing. And so I want to once again thank everyone, the administration who listened to my endless rants and yelling and frustrations in all the meetings, Deputy Mayor Glenn's office and HPD and DCP and SBS and SCA and DOHMH. They listened and listened because I kept talking. I know what our district needs, and I refuse to accept anything less than what this district needs. So I am grateful that we are here, and I look forward to the continued work. And once again, thank you to all of my colleagues, and congratulations to our speaker on rent regulation. As a former assembly member, uh, we've always supported rent regulation and rent reform in the state. So I proudly vote aye on all. Thank you. Joe Nye. Thank you. Gordonchik. 
I know. Wow. Oh. Was that was that six? I could. Woo! I could Keep have going. Asked. Holden. I and all. Kalos. I and all. Ku. I and all. Kozlowitz. I I know. Lanceman. Lander. Vote aye on all, and I request permission to vote aye on land use call-ups. Permission granted. Vote aye. Levin. Permission uh, to vote aye on all land use call-ups, and uh, may I may explain my vote. Permission granted. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Majority Leader. First, I want to uh, congratulate Council Members Cabrera and Gibson. Um, uh, Fernando, I've served with you for eight years, and Vanessa, I've served with you for four years. Um, I know that uh, both of you have a strong uh, core of beliefs and, um, and dedication to serving your constituents honestly and to the best of your abilities. And I know that you put that into practice in, um, in negotiating this project. And so, um, you know, and it's, a, it's never easy uh, with controversial land use projects, but uh, as long as you know deep in your heart that you have achieved everything that you set out to achieve in this and are representing uh, the needs of your constituents to the best of your ability. Um, I have full faith and trust in both of you, and so I want to congratulate you for, um, for a hard-fought victory here. Um, with regard to um, intro 605A, I want to thank uh, 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 Chairs uh, Richard and, um, and, uh, and, and Chair Lanceman uh, for conducting the hearing on, uh, on this bill. Uh, Chair Richards, uh, uh, as my co-sponsor, lead co-sponsor on this, um, and all the co-sponsors on the bill. Um, this is a very important bill because we need to have real accountability and real clarity and transparency around marijuana arrests in New York City, which uh, continue to plague um, uh, African American and Latino communities at a much higher rate uh, than white communities. Um, you know, back in 1993, uh, the arrest rate for marijuana charges for African Americans was 20.9 times higher than the arrest rate for white people. Um, in 2016, that number came down to 7.8 times higher. Absolutely, 100 percent unacceptable. 100 percent unacceptable. Uh, we should be uh, decriminalizing or legalizing marijuana in New York City um, because the fact of the matter is that arrests uh, lead to incarceration at Rikers. Uh, they, re they lead to um, uh, uh, issues that, will, uh, that will, people will carry with them for the rest of their lives, whether it affects their education or their job prospects. We cannot continue to criminalize African American and Latino communities in our city. Um, it you, is Chair absolutely Levin. unfair, and so I, I, I uh, encourage all my colleagues to vote aye on this and keep up the fight on that. And thank you very much, Madam Majority Leader. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Levine. Aye on all. Maisel. Menchaca. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you so much, Majority Leader, and thank you to my colleagues. Uh, I am voting aye on all and want to say a few words about uh, the rezonings that we are voting on today. I think the fight that we have ahead of us is a big fight, and our, as members, we do everything we can to make sure that we bring everything we can to our communities. What I want to also connect um, this work that we do is to leveling the playing field, and part of that is the resources that we're voting on today. And I just want to say thank you to the speaker, his team, and everyone here who is saying yes to bringing more resources. We're fighting against an incredible lobby of greed uh, that is fueling a lot of the gentrification that we're feeling and seeing in our communities. The more empowered we are with staff, the more empowered we are with community engagement, the better these rezonings are going to be in the long run. I look forward to that with the injection of this new resource. Uh, we have a lot of immigrants in our community, working families, public housing residents that deserve to understand what's happening. These, these land use processes in some ways feel like they're designed against us. Uh, we need to change that. And I want to lift up something that Councilmember Barron said. Um, that we might need to go back to MIH and look at it. How do we strengthen that so that we can really bring deeper affordability? Um, we passed some land use uh, last session that brought deep, affordable, 100% affordable in a project at a Brooklyn Public Library. The only reason we were able to do that it was because it was city property. That can't be the only way we get deep affordability in our, in our neighborhoods. So with that, I vote aye on all in the move to really bring a level playing field so that our communities can feel heard empowered, and at the table.
Thank you. Thank you. Miller. Permission to explain my vote, please? Permission granted. Thank you. Um, first off, I, I, I'd like to make a motion that the minutes of stated meeting of uh, February 14 be adopted as printed. Never let it be said that we abdicate our responsibility. Okay. Furthermore, um, I want to thank the sponsors of 605A. This is important legislation, as my uh, colleague Levin just mentioned. But representing a community that for nearly a decade has had the highest number of marijuana um, summonses and arrests in the city, uh, this is something that has deep impact on the young people in our community. Whether it is, and, and mind you, that this is a middle class community um, that is equally uh, diverse. And the, as we look at the numbers, the um, portion of the community that is a community of color are disproportionately impacted as they are throughout the city. But just to give you an example, 1,651 marijuana arrests and summonses uh, in 2016, risen to 2,100 in 2017, the second most had 400. There were other precincts that had 550 throughout the city. If this is not disproportionate. Now, while this will give us the tools to address those issues, I think it's blatant, it is obvious, and, and given these tools, whoever's responsibility it is to advocate, abdicate these uh, aggregate these numbers have not done their job to see for over a decade that there is a community that has been disproportionately burdened to this enormity. They are not doing their job, and that falls in the lap of one police plaza. We have to be better. Thank you. Thank you. Moya. Aye on all. Perkins. Aye on all. Powers. Aye on all, permission to explain my vote. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to, uh, to, to the speaker and thank you to this body for continuing to support uh, the rent stabilization law and rent regulation law in New York State and for uh, all the folks that came out today to say not only do we need to renew it, we need to strengthen it, something that is important to, to my neighborhood, my district, I also want to congratulate all of my colleagues, Councilmember Salamanca, Councilmember Van Bramer, Councilmember Gibson, and Councilmember Cabrera on their hard fought efforts on behalf of their communities, which is tied to the same conversation around affordable housing in New York City at this particular moment. And I know that uh, all these conversations with your community can be difficult, but to look at what Councilmember Gibson achieved for her district, to look at in Councilmember Salamanca's district to, to transform a jail into 700 units of affordable housing, these are the types of reasons I think many of us come to the City Council is to be uh, good stewards for our districts and our communities. So I want to congratulate all of them. I vote, as I said, aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilmember Miller, how do you vote? I vote aye on all. Thank you. Reynoso. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Uh, first, I just want to thank the men and women of the Department of Sanitation for the amazing work they did last, yesterday um, and today in making sure our streets were clean and functional. Yes, so uh, remember them during budget, te budget season because we will be making requests. But the Department of Sanitation continues to have this city moving um, with, um, with very little praise and recognition because when it's out of, out of sight, it's out of mind. But don't forget, they were out there last night working very hard to make sure we could get into work this morning. So I want to thank them. And I would also like to just make mention to the fact that we're talking about our Charter Revision Commission and opportunities to modify our charter. And in it, there might be an opportunity or there is an opportunity to look at ULERP and look at the way we, do the land, we move through the land use process and maybe allow these communities to come in at the front end 
and let us know what they're thinking about instead of at the tail end. And we won't have the same type of um, this discourse that, that looks like we're working against each other when we're really all on the same page and trying to do what's best for the city of New York. And with that, I want to congratulate my colleagues from the Bronx who, again, tend to be the borough that creates the most affordable housing and is also the poorest borough in the city of New York. And I don't think that that's by chance. Uh, but I want to say thank you to them for their hard work. And I vote aye on all. Thank you. Great plug for sanitation. Richards. Uh, permission to explain my vote. Permission granted. Uh, thank you, and thank, I want to thank the speaker uh, for his leadership on several bills today. Um, and one I want to just speak on, intro 262, which requires the Department of Education to provide school level data regarding students receiving special education services. I was astounded to walk into one of my middle schools and see that um, within that one middle school, there are two schools that have upwards of close to combined, a combination of 400 IEPs uh, in that one building. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, what we found is that the resources weren't really being offered uh, to those schools at the levels they needed to be offered. Um, so this, this bill is a very important bill in terms of shining transparency, which we're hoping is going to push DOE to ensure that our schools are receiving uh, their fair share of resources to address and aid uh, students with IEPs. Secondly, I wanted to congratulate both council members Gibson and Cabrera uh, on their leadership. And, you know, we get into a lot of conversation around these rezonings and, and you know, one of the things I, I often, when uh, uh, council member Gibson uh, called and asked for advice, I would say is leadership is not about winning popularity contests. And it's really about looking at the issues in your community and being able to resolve some of those longstanding issues while fostering new opportunities. And I think they really did do that. And for those who say you're gentrifying through a rezoning, we have nine private sites after my rezoning, um, and all of them are projected to be 100% affordable as well. That's upwards of over 3,000 affordable housing units just in one catchment area. <laughs> Lastly, I'll touch on marijuana and just thank Councilmember Levin for his leadership on this. And I know Councilmember Miller spoke on this, but the 911 and 311 data that the NYPD is certainly using to justify marijuana arrests and summonses is baloney, and I am the first to say it. Um, and it's really irrelevant right now. It is the wild, wild west of enforcement, and I'm glad we're passing this bill to finally address some of the disparities and shine a brighter light on this issue. I want to thank the Public Safety uh, Committee staff. I want to thank Education Council. Smita Deshmuk and my legislative director, Jordan Gibbons, and, and Education Chair Traeger for my bill, and of course, Speaker Johnson Thank for you. his leadership. Thank you. And how do you vote? I proudly vote aye on all of these. Thank you, Councilmember. Rivera. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. I want to thank my colleagues in the Finance Committee and, of course, all the members of the City Council for their support on the Article 11 property tax exemption at 346 East 21st Street, which is an affordable housing property in my district. This is a six-floor, 30-unit building. 17 of the 30 units are families, original tenants. And this HDFC is an affiliate of the Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association, which, as many of you know, is a pioneer in affordable housing and community land trusts. I want to thank, of course, the Cooper Square Committee and one of the tenant leaders there who's a housing activist, Tito Delgado. Hope he's watching. Uh, congrats to all of my colleagues on their projects. And with that, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Rose. I want to congratulate Council Members Gibson and Cabrera, and I vote aye on all. Rosenthal. Similarly, congratulating Gibson and Cabrera. Um, the work we do, oh, I'm sorry, permission to explain my I vote? Permission granted. And I just want to say, you look mighty fine sitting up there. You've got good taste, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations to Councilmember Gibson and Cabrera. I vote aye on all. And I really want to thank the speaker again, as we did this morning at this morning's rally, for his leadership on extending rent regulation, you know, we are, we're swinging away down here at the city level, doing everything we can to pick up the pieces, but the real work needs to be done uh, in Albany, and, um, you know, I think under your leadership speaker, we might be able to make some traction there, but uh, thank you for your leadership on this. Aye on all. Thank you. Salamanca. 
I would like to congratulate Council Member Cabrera and uh, Council Member Gibson uh, for your outstanding work in ensuring that the Bronx is well represented and well taken care of. And I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Torres. Just want to congratulate the Bronx Dream Team, our land use chair, Councilmember Rafael Salamanca, Councilmember Gibson, Councilmember Cabrera. I thank you for just bringing really a level of investment in parks and schools in the Bronx that's seldom seen. So uh, with that said, I vote aye. Traeger. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. So I want to, of course, uh, commend all my colleagues on their uh, legislation today. I also want to just commend the speaker for his leadership uh, with regards to our rent laws. And, and, and since, you know, the state and, and the city leaders have had a lot of discussions about empowering us over discussions about the MTA or others, it's time to repeal the Erstat laws and give us control over our, over our housing policies here. I also want to just say uh, credit, give credit to council members Gibson, Cabrera, as well as Salamanca and, and others uh, for championing these issues in the districts, but also looking at a land use application holistically. Uh, we have to look at them as, as, as a neighborhood impact. Uh, certainly people deserve quality, affordable housing, but they also deserve good schools. They deserve beautiful parks. They deserve quality hospitals. And they deserve a reliable transportation system too. So I just want to credit them for their leadership. Um, they've worked so hard on this. And also to Chair Salamanca of the Land Use Committee, who has really been very supportive uh, as well to all of us with, with the ORP applications, and Ch Chair Moya as well. So I want to congratulate them and the speaker. And I vote aye on all. Valone. I and all, congratulations to everyone. Van Bramer. With great pride, because I get to represent the great neighborhood of Long Island City, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Williams. May I be sure to vote? Permission granted. Thank you. You look great up there. So nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Won't give you extra time, however. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we made the right choice. <laughs> Uh, a lot of good bills today, so I want to congratulate everyone who had them, and including the speaker uh, for the leadership he's put on this bill and in, this, and in the council uh, thus far. Of course, the marijuana reporting is extremely important. Um, and the Jerome rezoning, uh, I'm going to be voting aye on all, so congratulations to Gibson and Cabrera. I do want to say uh, the problem is uh, I believe this body and the mayor failed uh, by passing the MIH that we have passed. Uh, I believe we chose political expediency as opposed to doing what we know needed to be done. Uh, the problem is I can't hold individual council members responsible for a job that we all failed at. I do hope that we do look at uh, MIH and revisit it. I'm glad that the council members chose the best option, which is option one. Of course, a deep affordability exists if and when property owners choose to use the term sheets, which it looks like they will use for some time because the market doesn't bear anything else. But at that time, when the market changes, they will no longer have to use those term sheets, and that is a problem. So my hope, again, is that this body, I'm proud to have been part of the voice that pushed MIH as far as it did. I'm also too proud to be uh, one of the view who voted against it, and my hope is that we very much look at it to fix some of the loopholes. Um, I also want to lift up uh, Ricky Leong, uh, who was mentioned by Council Member Chin. Uh, I know him as a tenant leader way back when I was in Tenants and Neighbors. I was very surprised, um, saddened to see his death as I looked through his photos. I saw a picture of him and his young child holding a picture of me uh, for re-election, and uh, that really touched my heart. He was a very big supporter of mine from when I first ran, and I'm very sad uh, that we lost him. The tenant world has lost a great leader and a great champion. My prayers to his wife and his entire family. Um, as I said before, when it comes to rent regulation, uh, the governor and the has failed us. And I'm shocked as I move around the state to see how much he's failed on this issue across the state. I'm glad that we're doing what we can do here, uh, but we have to do a lot more. Congratulations to all those who put deep affordability. I've always been impressed by Councilman Salamanca. All of his projects have had very deep affordability. Congratulations. Generally, I say that Brooklyn is the best borough because of my dreams. I now have to give some shout outs to other boroughs like the Bronx. With that, I vote I and all. Thank you. Jaeger. I on all, with the exception of M28, M29, and accompanying resolutions R250 and R251. Matteo. Permission to vote on all land use call-ups? 
And um, I'm voting no on 600 and I and the rest. Permission granted. Combo. I proudly vote aye on all, and I just want to congratulate the Bronx for a huge win. Uh, Councilmember Salamanca, this is a huge victory. To see a correctional facility turned into a housing development speaks volumes about the growth and development that the Bronx has seen. And to Councilmember uh, Gibson, as well as uh, Councilmember Ferreira, um, Cabrera, I just want to thank you all for your courage, your tenacity, and your perseverance. Uh, this has been an incredible project. The ability to bring two 458-seat primary schools to address overcrowding, a commitment to preserve 2,500 units of housing over the next two years, AMIs as low as 40 percent, 60 million in parks investments, 50 million in DOT improvements. This is going to speak volumes. Uh, Councilmember Cabrera and Councilmember Gibson, this is certainly a legacy project that you should feel proud of, and I'm proud to stand uh, in support of you, and to see our borough in the Bronx doing so well is quite an accomplishment, and I thank you for your courage and tenacity, and I proudly vote aye. Speaker Johnson. I vote aye on all, and I would ask all council members, we're going to have a, a Democratic conference uh, after this, so if folks could stay and potentially limit the general discussion, unless you must really speak today, uh, it would be helpful for us to be able to, because folks have to go back to their districts, for us to be able to meet uh, together. So I vote aye on all. All items on today's general order calendar were adopted by a vote of 48 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions. With the exception of land use 28 and land use 29 with accompanying resolutions, which was adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions. And M28, M29 with accompanying resolutions, which was adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions. And intro 600A, which was adopted by a vote of 47 affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions. Thank you. Majority Leader, you've done a great job filling in. Thank you for being up there. Thank you. Now the introduction and reading of bills. All bills have been referred to committees as indicated on the agenda. Discussion of resolutions. Resolutions 188A, an amended resolution in determining that a public emergency requiring rent control in the City of New York continues to exist and will continue to exist on and after April 1st, 2018. We will do this by a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All those not in favor, the yeas have it, and we will now go on to uh, general discussion. And we will begin with Councilmember Cabrera. Uh, in deference to uh, the speaker's request, uh, I forgot my time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Kalos. I will also defer. Thank you. Very ben. powerful speaker, Councilmember Johnson. <laughs> Councilmember Ku. I have to speak, yeah. <laughs> Peter, I wouldn't have it any other way. Mr. Speaker and Majority Leader and all my colleagues, today I am introducing Intro 734 to ban smoking while walking on city sidewalks. We all had the experience of getting stuck behind a smoker while walking down a crowded city street. This bill looks to keep the nuisance of public cigarette smoke confined to more manageable spaces. If you want to smoke, stand off to the side. People can easily walk past you, but if you are walking down the sidewalk, you are carrying the smoke with you, and everyone behind you is breathing it in. I've seen too many mothers with strollers and parents holding hands with their children, walking behind smokers who are blowing clouds of smoke behind them and swinging their arms while holding a lit cigarette. 
One of my staff was actually burned by a careless smoker who touched her arm with a lit cigarette. In a perfect world, every smoker will have the self-awareness to realize that smoking and walking down the crowded sidewalk subjects everyone behind you to breathe, to breathe in the firms. Enforcement will be minimal and up to the discretion of police. We are not looking to throw the boat at smokers, but we cannot ignore the fact that we live in a city of over 8 million people, and we all share the same sidewalks. One person's actions impacts everyone around them. This is a, this is a quality of life issue that can use a stronger hand. Other cities around the world have similar laws. Tokyo has banned smoking and walking on sidewalks. They even have signs on streets reminding you not to smoke and walk like this. So I hope you join me in signing on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Koo. Thank you. Peter, I love that clip art. Yeah. <laughs> Who's next? Councilmember Rivera. Council Rivera. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the individual that Margaret mentioned earlier who we lost in our district. I want to express my deep sadness for a beloved son of the Lower East Side, Ricky Leung, who we lost last week. Ricky Leung was born and raised in the LES, moving to Brooklyn to start his family. I had the honor of knowing this wonderful individual who cared about his family, his community, and doing the right thing for tenants and low-income families. Ricky and I had the same mentor, Marie Christopher, a local activist who died in January 2013. Before she left us, she told Ricky to look out for me and to continue his work around organizing and advocacy. And Ricky never faltered. He was active with tenants and neighbors and good old Lower East Side and a big part of important campaigns around housing and land use, specifically the Seward Park Urban Renewal Area, now called Essex Crossing, and around activating space in our community for local youth. Ricky Leung was an architect who brought compassion and reason to urban planning. He understood New York City real estate, but always put people over profit. His expertise and grit brought him to DC where Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez had him testify before Congress on the importance of the Section 8 program. Ricky was a caretaker looking after his parents and he always mentioned his true loves, his wife, Sam, and his son, Jason. Ricky will be profoundly missed. He was respected and loved and his departure left a big loss in our community and citywide. He will live on through his accomplishments and he will always be in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Williams. Thank you. Uh, I will cut short my laundry list of your request, but I do want to lift up uh, Mario Franco. Um, her assassination really did touch me uh, because of the similarities of so many of the issues that we fight off. She was 38 years old. Uh, she was a black woman. She was part of the LGBT GNC community. She lift up, lifted up the voices so many of us lift up here. Feminist, she fought for LGBT GNC rights for black, uh, for the black community, for the poor community. She was part of a 51-member uh, delegation. She won the first time she ran. She was assassinated coming back uh, from a black empowerment uh, event. Uh, someone I know who works in the favelas gave me such a rundown of the beautiful work she was doing, and even said she was being, she was one of the people who was probably going to be head of the committee that over, had oversight in the police department. Um, it touched me a lot because uh, uh, many of us think of ourselves as courageous when we're fighting for those issues. Uh, she is a stalwart of courage. Thankfully, I'm always recognizing the country I'm in, the city I'm in, uh, you do have to have some courage. Uh, thankfully, for the most part, not the type of courage she had to have had uh, to continue to move forward even when danger was near. Her sister said she was doing uh, what she loved to do. She also said uh, that she believed she was assassinated because she was becoming a menace. She was the only black woman uh, on the body, even though the Brazilian population is uh, half black or of mixed race. I hope we continue to lift up her name, uh, the work that she was doing. As we can see, the work that we speak of uh, is around the world. And uh, we, we've heard the words menace, we've heard the words agitator, we've heard a lot of the words before. Uh, but that usually means you are doing something right. Unfortunately, she lost her life. She was assassinated 
for the very things we fight for here. And that really just struck a nerve with me. And I want to make sure we continue to lift her up and the things she was fighting for. Thank you. Thank you, and may her soul rest in peace. Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Madam President. I'll be brief, as Mr. Speaker requested, uh, in the interest of time and getting us all back to our districts. Uh, today I'm introducing uh, Resolution 244. Uh, approximately a little over a month and a half ago, uh, we watched what happened in Florida when a lone gunman walked in to a high school and assassinated, murdered 17 children, uh, left many more injured. I've spoken about this on the floor. Many of you, my colleagues, have spoken about this here on this floor. And, uh, you know, as, as I've said, we, there's not really a lot we can do as a government body, as a legislature, to make uh, guns, uh, uh, to, to lessen the availability of weapons and uh, ammunition in the hands of those who shouldn't have them. But what we can do is keep the pressure on those who can. And so my resolution calls on the Congress to enact the SAFE law, just like we have it in New York State. It's not the best solution, but it's a good solution. It's a, it's a law that uh, makes it more difficult, not an outright ban, doesn't take them all away, but it makes it more difficult for people who shouldn't have guns, who shouldn't have 30 round clips, nobody should have 30 round clips, um, to enact that into law. Now, I don't think this Congress is gonna do it, but I think that if we start speaking now and we start the ball this year and we keep on talking about it, maybe, maybe, maybe next year we get a Congress that will pass this. And so I urge my colleagues, please, to sign on to Resolution 244 so that we can get a hearing as soon as possible so that we can speak with one voice and get that rolling in Washington. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. And our final speaker, if there are none others, will be Councilmember Ben Kalos. Uh, thank you. I deferred in hopes others might, but uh, to, to modest success. It's bittersweet to be back from paternity leave, though I plan to complete the remainder of my full leave this summer. I have an amazing new daughter uh, and my wife at home who are likely watching. I just want to tell them how much I love them and to my wife that I fall more and more in love with her every day. Uh, and so it will also come as no surprise to them and those of you in this body that today I'm introducing five bills uh, following this week's report by the council outlining issues and strategies to take on school overcrowding. A majority of our schools, elementary and middle, are actually overcrowded. Yet the city plans to build fewer school seats than in the past, ignoring current overcrowding and future need. As recommended in the report, I'll be resubmitting Introduction 7029, requiring SCA to publicly release its methodologies and underlying data that continues to underestimate need and continue overcrowding. The remaining legislation is a package of democracy legislation that may seem familiar from last term and may have been referenced by another elected official seeking to do it on their own. Uh, the first is fixing a flaw in our otherwise great campaign finance system in the country. Introduction <coughs> 732 with co-primary sponsor Cabrera and Powers will allow for the first time a candidate to run a campaign for city office slopes solely on small dollars. Introduction 733 with co-primary sponsors Traeger and Rosenthal would expand the council's initiatives originally proposed by council member Rosenthal to actually register high school students in school. Introduction 731 would require landlords to distribute voter registration forms with leases and introduction 730 would put candidates on the ballot when they qualify for public matching. And congratulations to you and your wife on the birth of your daughter, and we look forward to you celebrating and achieving your family leave. And since we're giving shout outs to family members, hi, Prince. Okay. Uh, ben, and congratulations. I am shocked that you're introducing five bills today. <laughs> and we'll now have closing remarks from Council Member and Speaker Corey Johnson. Thank you all very much. If folks could uh, go downstairs to the Members Lounge, we're going to have a quick Democratic conference. And thank you, Majority Leader Cumbo, for doing a great job filling in today. Congratulations to all the members today. Thank you. Thank you.